This week's edition of NJBIA's Minding Your Business is brought to you in part by AT&T, helping family, friends, and neighbors connect in meaningful ways every day. From the first phone call 140 years ago to mobile video streaming today, AT&T innovates to improve lives. And by New Jersey Business Magazine, providing the critical information needs for New Jersey's business community for more than 65 years. Welcome to NJBIA's Minding Your Business. I'm Bob Considine. Well, Governor Murphy has presented his revised FY21 budget to the legislature, which calls for $4 billion in borrowing, a few cuts, and also new taxes. Here to discuss the proposal and the business community's reaction to it is NJBIA Vice President of Government Affairs, Christopher M. Holtz. Chris, thanks for being here. Let's get right to it. Uh, what are the overarching things the governor has proposed in this budget? Well, first of all, thank you, Bob, for having me, and I appreciate being here to represent the business community. Uh, it's a $40.1 billion budget, and that is $1.4 billion more than prior year budget, which is a little hard to understand when you have, you're in the middle of a global pandemic, in the middle of a worldwide economic downturn, and we're spending $1.4 billion more than the previous year. It's also $3.4 billion more than the last budget that Governor Christie left for Governor Murphy and inherited. Right. So we're, we're in a tough spot. Right. So. You know, we've, we've heard about taxing and spending before. This is nothing new. But is it surprising, given the gravity of New Jersey's economy right now, that is it surprising that we're still seeing this call for more taxation? I think it is surprising. We did for months when businesses were down. Um, we heard, oh, it's not appropriate to kick them when they're down. It's not appropriate to uh, go after the same taxpayers, same small businesses that have been closed because of a government order, that have had limited operations because of a government order. And now we're going to go and ask them, you know what, you need to kick a billion dollars into this budget um, when they're already down and they're already struggling right. and they're already looking at possibly closing or possibly moving out of the state to a more hospitable state for businesses. And now they have this in front of them. All right. So obviously the governor's proposal is a starting point uh, and the legislature will come back with their own version. What are the, some of the things that you would like to see as this proposal goes through a process of being amended before finalized? Well, I think the business community wants to see a more fiscally responsible plan. That fiscal responsibility, I kind of boil down to four major points. Okay. Uh, number one, this budget includes approximately a billion dollars in new taxes. There is absolutely no need for those taxes when you actually get into the details of the governor's budget. Um, number two is this budget includes four billion dollars in borrowing. That borrowing today, if, especially if it's done improperly, that borrowing is going to lead to hundreds of millions of dollars in new debt service that'll make potentially the next 35 budgets more expensive and increasing the affordability issues that we already have in New Jersey. What we'd like to see is that $4 billion of new borrowing, that $1 billion in new taxes, that amounts to $5 billion that I would say is irresponsible revenue. Hmm. So if there's some way that the legislature can push back on the governor and bring that $5 billion of irresponsible revenue down to a more manageable position. We know being realistic and being in New Jersey um, that we, do we expect some of that $5 billion to remain? Maybe. <laughs> um, but, and it doesn't stop us for asking for sure. it to go away, yep. but is there some way to bring that five to a more manageable level where it's not going to be hurting future taxpayers as much, not going to be hurting the very businesses that have already given so much and closed for months, uh, not hurting them? I, I think it's possible. And a couple of the things that we look at to make it possible is two of the bigger parts of this budget where spending goes up is in the surplus and in the pension payment. Right. Two things where we're actually spending more but it's actually not helping anybody right now. Where the, the idea of a surplus is to save money and, and give a cushion to the budget that's going to help when times are tough and help deal with maybe an unexpected emergency or crisis. Right. We're in that well, unexpected that's, that's emergency crisis. That's exactly what crisis. I was going to say. This is the time yeah. you'd use exactly. it. Yeah. Exactly. And so it, it's, it's sometimes surplus is called a rainy day fund. There, there's another official rainy day fund, but, but that rainy day fund, we're in the rainy day right now. Mm -hmm. And so before Governor Murphy, um, before the FY20 budget started, the surplus was $1.3 billion. 
it went to 1.7 billion, and now it's up to 2.2 in its proposal. So all BIA, all the business community is asking for is if you just take that 2.2 and bring it back to the 1.3 before this crisis started. Right. Because when you're in a crisis like this, it's not the time to put money away. Right. It's the time to actually rely on that cushion that you've built up. And thankfully, Governor Murphy has focused on increasing our surplus in recent years. Now's the time to use it. I was going to say, you know, a surplus is a good thing. You know, you don't typically, you want to build that up as much as you can. Yes. But right now is not the, is not the time we need to build it up as opposed yes. to using it for other things. Yes, exactly. And so if you take that, that $900 million of built up surplus that happened over the course of this pandemic, mm -hmm. if you just take that $900 million, that's about the same amount of money as the new taxes. Right. So surplus, keep it flat, taxes go away. Right. And I think you had one more, the pension, right? The other, the other part is um, the pension going up. Yeah. That's not helping anybody today. New Jersey has not missed a single pension payment. Is it a good thing that Governor Murphy is, is maintaining the 10th track and, and, and continue to increase the size of the pension payments? Yes. Right. Is it a bad thing that we've had governors of both parties that have not put enough into the pension system and, and kind of neglected their duties? Yes, that, that, that's bad. No one's fault, but that, that's bad that's happened in the past. So we're at the 8th, 10th level that Governor Murphy's proposed. I think if we just go back and keep it flat to last year at the 7 tenths level, don't backtrack on the good right. progress we've made, but at 7 tenths, that frees up another $1.2 billion. So you add that 1.2 to the 900 million, you have $2.1 billion. Right. That's $2.1 billion that can eat into the pension pay, uh, the, uh, the borrowing and eat into the tax increases. So you can actually take that 5 billion of irresponsible revenue right. and make it a little less than 3 billion. So it sounds like you want to, we should get away from borrowing as much as we can. Yes because of the long-term effects, the potential long-term yes. effects. We've borrowed in the past in New Jersey, and we've, I think I've heard you say in the past, um, you know, we're, it could take 30 years to pay off certain things. And I, I don't have the details in front of me, you do, uh, Mr. Abacus here, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we've borrowed however many years ago, and we're still paying some yes. of those figures off, correct? So no, and, and, and borrowing is not entirely inappropriate. Borrowing right. for roads and bridges makes sense. Mm -hmm. And even borrowing when you're in a, hopefully this is a once in a generation crisis, hopefully we never see anything like this again in our right. lives, but a knock on wood. <laughs> um, but, but that once in a generation crisis, if you have to borrow to make sure that you can get through that without too many detrimental cuts to the people of New Jersey, right. that may make sense at a small level, but it's important to limit that as much as possible. All right. What about taxation? What, what, what is the proposal this year, what, what new taxes or increased taxes are we talking about? So the, the two biggest tax increases that Governor Murphy proposed is number one, the millionaire's tax that we've heard all too much about yeah. in recent years. Uh, since Governor Murphy has come into office, he's proposed that in every one of his budgets. The legislature, his first two budgets pushed back on that. We don't know if they're going to continue pushing back on that as hard as they have in the past, but Luckily, Governor Murphy has not gotten the millionaire's tax he's proposed um, in the past two years. Right. We don't know what's going to happen over the next, uh, next month or so, but that's, uh, that's one of his taxes. The second biggest tax that he's proposed is an increase in the corporate business tax. Um, that, that corporate business tax is an interesting one because yeah. a couple years ago, Governor Murphy's first budget, we actually increased it in the first place, but on a temporary basis. And now the talk is of making that permanent the sad thing about this, and, and again, this is kicking businesses when they're down, the very ones that are struggling, is our businesses throughout the state saw the business tax rate go down. We are one of the highest in the nation at 11.5% yeah, right like now. number two, right? Um, and, and January 1st, we actually went down one percentage point, which right. is a good thing, right. uh, per that sunsetting in that bill a few years ago. But Governor Murphy's proposing to go back and reverse that January 1st decline, so again, that that unpredictability that businesses struggle with in New Jersey is you never know when a tax is actually going to go down. You're always thinking they're going to go up right. and, and businesses have a hard time planning mo uh, multiple years. So reverse that and then it was supposed to go down again back to the 9% that was already high right. but um, not among the highest in the nation right. and he wants to keep that 9 from never getting there and keep at the 11 and a half rate. I see. Um, just a few more moments. Uh, you know, to be fair to Governor Murphy, he's got, he has got a difficult job. I mean, he's got an unprecedented um, uh, health crisis he's had to deal with all year. When he says, you know, we need all these borrowing and extra taxes, we have this huge deficit, what is your response to that? Is that an accurate state? Is it, is what he's asking for, does it fit the deficit? I, I guess is what I'm trying to ask. You, you're 100% right. Governor Murphy's got an enormously difficult job in front of him. And it's on the public health side and, and it's a fiscal side. And he's talked about how the, the health emergency and the fiscal emergency are intertwined. 
Um, I think it's appropriate to find some balance when you're looking at an emergency like this. Right. You don't want to have the impact fall on taxpayers exclusively. You don't want to have um, all the cuts fall on the side of, of any particular segment of our economy and society. You want to spread that out. You want to balance the pain um, and the difficulties that happen. I don't think we're adequately seeing the spread of that. Uh, we're not seeing enough balance. Okay. And one last thing in closing. You know, um, we want to go bigger picture here. We, we haven't talked about pension reform. This is another budget that does not, uh, I believe, does not include pension reform. Um, what are the dangers here if we keep going down the line? I understand, I saw you did a report. It was $215 billion in debt this state is. What is the long-term prognosis to the state if we don't find pension reform? Well, I opened up this talking about how spending and, and not really understanding how, but it's going up. I, I don't see how spending goes up, and, and we're not asking for across-the-board cuts to things that would hurt the regular people, especially our vulnerable citizens in New Jersey. We're asking for a right-sizing of the budget. Uh, I think it's a good thing that Governor Murphy flattened school aid. Um, they're not going up, but they're not going down. Right. And if you flatten school aid as opposed to um, cut it, that's maybe going to help property taxes. It's going to help our school teachers and our children, and that's the future workforce of the state. Sure. So, so we understand that. Right. But I, where it's worrisome is you have an opportunity here where where is New Jersey an outlier with how much we spend? Our state does spend more than other states. Is that sometimes a good thing? Yeah. Is that sometimes a bad thing? Yeah. But often where we're outliers, we should try to correct that. We talked about balance, bring, bring everything to the middle, moderating things. So one of those things that we're not in balance is we, we have very, very generous public employee benefits. That's on the pension side and the health side. We're not saying that you cut them to a level that is not manageable for these people. Um, the, the health side, we talked about having platinum benefits. Yeah. We're not saying cutting those benefits. Mm -hmm. We're not saying making them bad benefits, but going to gold benefits. Gold's still pretty good. Yeah. Gold was the gold standard on President Obama's Affordable Care Act. Absolutely. But if we get to gold, we save considerable amounts of money on the state level, and also it's property tax relief. Right. Uh, on the pension side, we have a generous pension system. Uh, public employees deserve a, a reliable pension. They deserve to be secure when they retire but we don't need to be among the more generous in the nation. So if we can right-size that, those are cuts that are not hurting anybody today. They're making our state more affordable for everyone, including right. the, the pensioners and, and the, the public employees that we're talking about. But it's doing it in a way that makes our state more competitiveness. And I think we, we talk about competitiveness, anything we can do to make ourselves more affordable and more competitive is going to make us stronger and fairer in the long run. Right. And I think that's the kind of reform we need. This crisis is an opportunity to do that right-sizing of the budget, and we think it's a lost opportunity right now because we haven't seen it. All right. Chris Emmerholtz, great, great job. Well said. Well done. And thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Come Bob. Come back soon. Thank you. Okay. Zago Manufacturing Company is a global maker of custom ceiling solutions and components. CEO Gail friedberg Rodenstrike took a leap of faith and started this company 27 years ago with her husband, and we're extremely proud to have you here today. Gail, welcome. Tell us specifically what Zago Manufacturing Company produces. Thanks for having me, Bob. We make uh, two lines of products, self-sealing fasteners and sealing switch boots. The self-sealing fasteners are screws, nuts, and bolts that have a groove under the head of the fastener in which we place a rubber O-ring. The screws are of different um, metals and the O-rings are as well. The other line of products we have are sealing switch boots and covers for electrical switches. And um, so it, like if you have a um, push button switch and it's gonna be in a harsh environment, you cover it, we cover it with the rubber and then you, know, you put that over the switch and it protects the switch. All right. I know, you know, I understand this is, first of all, every pun intended, this is riveting information, both literally and figuratively. But what are the main industries that you serve um, with your products? So originally the products were military products, but since that time, um, since its origination, uh, we've expanded. Aerospace obviously is, you know, the first natural expansion from military. Um, and. We do a lot of sales to the medical device industry, um, the burgeoning robotics industry, especially undersea robotics, where you need to seal out water and you need to maintain the correct internal pressure. We also sell the products to um, alternative energy producers, uh, energy recapture, 
and um, eat traditional energy producers also. And we, our job is to you know, expand the industries that use our product and we've been doing that. Um, we probably sell to a hundred different industries. Wow, yeah, this is an original product and it's coming out of Newark and, and so it, it has a global impact. It's been really great. Um, so COVID-19 happens, manufacturers are basically essential. I wanted to find out how COVID-19 impacted your business in terms of both production and maintaining a workforce? Um, well, we were really prepared when COVID-19 came because we were keeping on top of the information um, coming about the effects in Europe and China. So we were really ready to go um, when Governor Murphy had his, his executive order. As a matter of fact, the week before that, we had prepared our workforce uh, we sent everybody home who could work from home, and um, we had our workforce who was who were coming in already um, doing the social distancing and um, engaging in good sanitation practices. Uh, at, so we we were really you know ready to go, um, and we were also working very closely with NJMEP, the New Jersey Manufacturers Extension Program, to make sure that all essential manufacturers, and I do believe all manufacturers in New Jersey are essential, were able to keep up and running. We actually, we only closed for two days. Wow. And that was a, a few weeks into the crisis. And we closed because some employees were expressing some discomfort. So we want, we closed up and, um, you know, we cleaned and did extra sanitation and made sure that they felt comfortable to come back. And we have not been closed one business day since. So I was, was also wondering, I know automation's a big part of your production um, process. Did that help at all in terms of keeping up with production? Yeah, um, we, you know, we can naturally socially distance on our factory floor. And obviously, you know, the factory workers, the manufacturing workers are essential um, to any manufacturing business. Uh, we'd spent years uh, improving our automation. So now we have machine operators who don't operate one or two machines, they operate three or four machines. And, you know, if you've seen a, a machine on a factory floor, one machine itself is, you know, can be six feet long. So they've got plenty of distance between them. Yeah. Um, so, and it, it also enabled us to really ramp up when we did have some extra need for production and need to get things out quicker because of the demands of COVID-19. Yeah, I mean, some of the machines in your place are just astonishing to look at and to, to see them at work, is, it's, it's otherworldly. It's really amazing. Um, tell us about your vendors. I mean, uh, were, they, were they impatient? Did they, did you, were you able to fulfill what they needed or were they not, were they not needing as much as that during the past few months? Uh, our vendors were really on top of working with us. Uh, we spent years creating great relationships with our vendors. Uh, so when the crisis hit and we needed product right away, um, particularly in, in terms of the products that we were selling to GM and Ventec to make ventilators, they were right there for us. They really wanted to be on board with us. Um, they knew that you know whatever we bought from them, they could trust us to, to you know, be there able to pay for it. We had one vendor, a local vendor, and we try to keep all our vendors, you know, super local to either New Jersey or the Northeast um, area uh, that did have to close because of COVID. Right. And, um, you know, we worked with them. We kept in close communication with them, waiting for them to open up. And um, because of our long history with them, when they did open up, they put our products at the, you know, in our needs at the front of their line so that we could get our products out. And Zig was was a part of the the ventilator supply chain as well in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, so um, we've had a long-standing relationship with Ventec, which is a, a major ventilator supplier. So when GM partnered with Ventec um, to bring on um, production of you know tens of thousands of ventilators, we were naturally in that supply chain, and we worked very closely with GM during the period that it was ramping up its uh, Co Kokomo, Michigan factory. Um, and we're still, you know, now GM has handed the keys over to Ventec to that factory, but we're still working very closely with Ventec. Very good. I just want to touch on uh, one of Zago's core missions uh, as well, Gail. 
I know sustainability is a big part of uh, Zago's, um, you know, way of life, basically. And also for you, um, as a deputy mayor of Fairlawn, how has sustainability been able to keep up during this time, during this time of COVID? Has it been impacted at all? Um, you know, the sustainability practices that we put into place prior to COVID, for the most part, we're able to maintain them. Um, we're still doing all the, you know, waste recycling and the metal waste recycling, the oil recycling, all those kinds of practices that we did before. Luckily, you know, the companies that we work with are still up and running. Um, you know, we have a 50 kilowatt solar array and that's, you know, still running. We've had a lot of sunny days lately. So right. um, but probably the way that it, it's been disadvantaged is that, you know, because we spend so much time thinking about COVID-19 and, you know, how to meet our customers' needs and our employees' needs better, we haven't been able to put into practice it, more new sustainability. Right practices. So, mm -hmm. I mean, but, you know, that's something that we're going to be turning to again very soon, but we're, you know, we've definitely maintained everything that we had been doing. Right. And, and just in closing, Gail, I know uh, having been to your, um, your facility and knowing you guys, you guys were an award for excellence winners for NJBA in 2019. Uh, a big thing you also like to do is incorporate youth into showing what manufacturing jobs can bring to them in the future if they choose that path. Um, I'm assuming you're not able to do that at this time, but is that something you see continuing for Zago uh, while we're kind of uh, shut down a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we, you know, we haven't lost our link with the high schools. We're still, you know, communicating with the high schools, even as they're trying to figure out their fall schedules. Um, and we had had two interns from Cristo Ray High School last year, and we're still working with them personally. One, um, we're um, supplying the gap in his tuition um, for his new, new high school since Cristo Ray closed. Mm -hmm. And the other uh, is an intern that we've basically kept on. She's been working with us through the summer. She helped us with a, a lean project um, and we're going to keep we're going to keep her on um, as long as she can accommodate it in her virtual learning schedule and we're going to as soon as this you know the high schools are up and running and we can you know be in contact again with the science teachers as we were before we're going to um, plan some virtual tours right uh, we're just waiting for the word from them but we're ready to go we know how to do this All right well gail this is great i'm glad to see zago is following up on every mission it's known for during these difficult times and uh, you guys are great. We appreciate you being here. Thank you, Gail. Thank you so much. Up next on Minding Your Business, Emmy Award-winning TV anchor Carrie Barrett tells us how to make your best on-camera appearance. These days, it's anything but business as usual. That's why working together is more important than ever. AT&T is committed to keeping you connected so you can keep your patients cared for, your customers served, your students inspired, and your employees closer than ever. Our network is resilient. Our people are strong. Our job is to keep your business connected. It's what we've always done. It's what we'll always do. During an emergency, a network becomes a critical line of communication. Connecting first responders to technology and to each other. FirstNet is the only officially authorized wireless network built with and for first responders. It's highly secure, eliminates throttling, and cuts through the clutter of commercial traffic. It's the help you need to help the people who need you. Welcome back to Minding Your Business. While we're all doing more remote working nowadays, so how do we make our best on-camera appearance? Earlier this year, Vinny Civitello and Kate Conroy of NJBIA's Other People's Business podcast recently discussed this and other presentation tips with Carrie Barrett of Carrie Barrett Consulting. Let's see what they learned. Um, we have okay. this segment of the show where we yes. like to give advice to, to younger people. Okay. Or really anybody. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. If you're not anybody. younger, stop listening. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things, I mean, you mentioned, uh, you know, that you do consulting for yeah. video. You know, I have a lot of people that come into this place and they're on camera for the first time. and 
sometimes not the first time. Right. Like they could still use some advice. So give us some advice that you would give to somebody who's going to be in front of the camera for the first time, maybe in front of an audience for right. the first time. Yeah. So there's a couple of best practices that I think overlap. But one of the things that I get asked a lot about either medium, what do I wear? My basic is this. Women always look good in jewel tones. Mm -hmm. So What's a jewel tone? Um, it is emerald, it is fuchsia, sapphire. it is bright oh, okay. sapphire, yeah. cobalt. Sure. Bright and colors. A bright colors, Isn't there right? a jewel for every color? I, so. I yeah, but you don't want like um, a topaz or I mean, listen. If you know your colors and you know what your background is and you know how to do your makeup, depending on what you're wearing, then by all means, like you're most more educated than most people. But if you're not sure and you're second guessing what to wear, blue is a universally flattering color for everybody. So yep. blue, solid. Women look great in V-necks. Um, they tend to be more flattering, especially when it, you know it comes to camera, which it, which can add some weight. Unfortunately, that's just the way it goes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, blue is a universally flattering color for both on stage and on and on camera. I had a stylist say to me one time, "If you ever want to go to an event and get lost in the crowd, wear black because that's what everybody wears." And it's true. Wearing a color on stage for a big event is fabulous. Um, wearing black on camera, it can look great. It looks great on you right now. But if you don't know the quality of your cameras, black, red, and white are colors to stay away from. Hmm. Blue is a sure bet. Um, another question that I get is, what do I do with my hands? Yeah. And that, that hands down, it's the, what do I wear and what do I do with my hands? And here is my question, or my answer, excuse me. <laughs> if you, unless you were like wildly, you know, waving your hands around like Talladega Night style, if you ever saw that movie, <laughs> yeah. Um, do with your hands whatever you would normally do with your right. hands. And the reason is, if you try and if you talk with your hands and you try and stifle that, it stifles everything else about your speech. It stifles your natural body language. It stifles your ability to communicate authentically. So, do with your hands whatever it is that you would do. Watch yourself on camera. If your hands look distracting, make sure that you are using them in ways that emphasize what you're talking about. Other than that, I think you are good to go. And I would say the other thing is to remember energy. It's another big mistake that people make. They tend to think that they are very animated when in fact they look like they have been medicated. And I know that I know this. That's not um, you know, a, a criticism necessarily. I know this because I it's something I did, right? I, I remember watching myself in those first few broadcasts and I'm like, wow, I thought it was really like bam, you know, jumping off the screen and I look like I'm tired. Everything on camera is flattened. Everything on a big stage with a large audience that goes back, your gestures, everything are diminished and muted. So energy, gestures are always usually, uh, you know, a little bit larger than life in both mediums. There's, sure. you know, every rule is made to be broken, but as a general, as a general rule, that's one to follow. And when you practice, don't practice for perfection. Just practice to plan. Mm -hmm. People practice, and they they stop when they make a mistake. And one of the most important things to do is to keep pushing on because you practice to learn how to handle those mistakes. So if you're up on stage and your PowerPoint goes down, or you've got a heckler in the crowd, or you mm -hmm. lose your train of thought, you need to have the tools to be able to handle those mistakes and keep on moving. So when you practice, Practice to plan for that stuff. Don't practice for perfection. Perfection is unattainable. Oh, it's unattainable. It's a waste of your time. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. I love that piece of advice because I feel like people don't do it often enough. They don't call it to their, like the elephant in the room. Let's just talk about it. Yeah. PowerPoint fell. Whatever. Yeah. It's yeah. Done. yeah. Oh my gosh. Give me a second. I'm going to try to wiggle this or whatever. Right. And, you know, like it just, it happens. And you think in your mind, oh my God, oh my God, I'm failing. I'm failing. I can't believe this. I want to, I wish, the, I wish the hole would open up in the stage and I would fall through. And meanwhile, everybody out in the audience is thinking, wow. She handled that pretty well. Right. I wonder if I could have handled it that well. I mean, really, honest to God, that's what they're thinking, unless you're, you know, a complete disaster, but let's mm. hope that's not the case. And yeah. I feel like in most cases, they're on your side. Yeah, like, they Nobody are. is rooting for you to fall on your face. No. Nobody is rooting for you to fail. They all want, because that would be uncomfortable for them. Right. <laughs> exactly. It makes the audience right. nervous. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So if you just roll with the punches and be like, oh, well, that didn't work. Let's, right. let's keep going and see what happens. To have a little humor about it, a little bit. And really, honestly, I'd say, turn your mistakes into personality showcases. Mm -hmm. Because a mistake is something, if you handle it well, can really draw your audience to you. It can right. endear you to them. And if you can handle it well, then people appreciate that. Exactly yeah. true. Good information.
Thank you, Vinny. Thank you, Kate. And thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next time on NJBI's Mind Your Business.